Killer Instinct began its life in the arcades and would eventually find its way to the Super Nintendo with a full game intact. At the time it was a sort of technical marvel and proved that Nintendo's little grey box was more than up to the challenge of bringing the arcade experience to the home. As with many fighting games, the main objective is to beat the living crap out of your opponent and Killer Instinct took this to a whole new level through the use of an extensive combo system that formed the basis of the gameplay. There's several characters to contend with who each possess their own unique skills as well as basic attacks, from the quick and nimble Jigo to the more methodical and punishing Saber Wolf. There's a nice selection to try out and get to grips with. Now visually, the game was obviously dialed back when compared to the arcade version, but not much was lost in the transition. The game is rendered in a similar fashion to that of Donkey Kong Country, with the 3D-like digitized graphics and clever camera work on the backgrounds making it stand out amongst other fighting games on the system. In the arcade version, this was achieved by each stage being stored as a movie file and essentially adjusting on a frame-by-frame -frame basis according to your movements. But in order to simulate this look on the Super Nintendo, the stages were of a 3D pan and camera were condensed into a 2D view, using parallax scrolling for the background and a raster effect for the ground or arena. The result was out of this world for the time, and once again proved that Rare were absolute masters of the hardware and could get it to do things other developers could only dream of. Of course, the same attention to detail was afforded to each of the fighters as well, with the animation of each being a true highlight. Even to this day, the game still manages to hold up and looks just as good as it did all those years ago. For those of you who don't know, one of the few Mega Man games for the Super Nintendo that was never released in North America was Mega Man and Base. It saw you having the ability to choose to play as Mega Man or Base, who had a dark appearance and had distinct skills that changed how you would play the game. Mega Man possessed all of his standard moves such as the Buster Shot and Slide, but Base was a bit more dynamic thanks to being able to rapid fire in any direction and also possessing a double jump ability, which would prove to be extremely useful later on in the adventure. Now if you do decide to play it, you'll soon discover that the game, and more specifically the boss battles, can be really challenging, regardless of which character you choose. In most Mega Man games, you simply learn the attack pan of a specific enemy and change your approach on the fly, but that's not going to cut it here, due to the sheer amount of different attacks each boss possesses. It'll likely result in a few bouts of frustration, but therein lies the charm of the series, and it's on full display with this entry. Graphically, Mega Man and Base is without a doubt one of the more impressive games on the system, and even manages to hold its own against some of the PlayStation releases as well. The majority of the game's sprites are quite huge, bright and animated smoothly. Even the typical helmet-wearing adversaries from earlier Mega Man games have an incredibly detailed walking animation, and additionally there are some charming little details, like Mega Man or Base's idol animation, which conveys to the player how low their health is at that point. Couple this with the colourful backgrounds and intricately designed enemies, and what you have is an experience that looks just as captivating today as it did when it first released. Although the difficulty can get out of hand at points, Mega Man and Base is still by far one of the best platformers on the Super Nintendo, so if you're a fan of the series or just the genre in general, there's plenty here to learn. Dragon Ball Z Hyper Dimension is quite easily one of the finest fighting games on the Super Nintendo, which unfortunately never made its way outside of Japan and Europe. It closely follows the events of the anime and pits the player against a range of characters from the show, and like many fighting games, each of them are given a specific set of moves and powerful combos that can be executed in the same style of Street Fighter, by rolling or pushing different directions in combination with the attack buttons. Because of this, the game is incredibly easy to pick up and play, allowing players of all skill levels to grab a piece of the action. Now when it comes to graphics, Dragon Ball Z Hyper Dimension offers some of the most spectacular sprite work the Super Nintendo ever saw. Each character is faithfully represented and shares plenty in common with their counterparts on the show, and this extends to each of their special moves as well. They often light up the screen in style, and lend each of them an epic quality that fans of the show will know and love. To top this off, the backgrounds are extraordinary well drawn, looking pretty much exactly like it does in the anime and manga, giving off that distinct Dragon Ball Z atmosphere. Matching this is the outstanding animation, and due to a unique decompression chip in the cart known as the SA-1, it allowed the game to store more data than other titles on the system, which resulted in each frame seamlessly blending together to create one of the smoothest fighting experiences on the Super Nintendo. With possibly the best graphics for a fighter on the system, fantastic fast-paced gameplay, 
and a whole lot of fun and replay value, Dragon Ball Z Hyper Dimension proves to be an outstanding 16-bit fighter that is well worth trying out for yourself and not just fans of the show. There is no shortage of quality sport titles on the Super Nintendo, but when it came to graphics, Winter Gold is by far the finest example of the bunch. The game is comprised of several different events, ranging from skiing to snowboarding and bobsleighing, and you've got several modes to jump into as well, with the main meat and potatoes of the game being served through the championship that sees you competing with several players from around the world, all vying for the best score. In addition to the pretty extensive single player options, Winter Gold would also come along with a multiplayer mode that made it perfect for playing with a group of friends. Now the first thing you'll notice about the game are its graphics and although they obviously look quite crude by today's standards, back in the day they were nothing short of phenomenal. Like many games before it such as Doom and Yoshi's Island, Winter Gold took advantage of the Super FX2 chip, allowing it to excel when it came to visual presentation. During its development the team created a track system that allowed them to create an infinite number of courses out of 8 different parts by having similar frames on each sequence to use as a transition into a new track section. This was mainly used to avoid the on-rails gameplay that was played over FMV backgrounds, which was a common technique used at the time. By doing so, it gave Winter Gold a true 3D look and feel, allowing the player to fully immerse themselves in the on-screen action, and this is most apparent during the bobsled events that actually managed to convey a true sense of speed as you make your way through to the end of each. Overall, it's not the best game out there gameplay-wise, but when it comes down to pure visual prowess, Winter Gold stands as a prime example of what could be squeezed out of the system when it was in the hands of the right developers. By the time 1992 rolled around, Mario had conquered the world of platformers and had had several ventures into different genres to varying degrees of success. Not content with resting on his laurels, there was another type of game that needed the Mario treatment, and that was racing. Nintendo came up with a concept that has lasted right up until this day, by pitting together several characters from their catalogue in a chaotic but fun kart racing experience, with some even going as far to say that this version is still the best you can play today. What made it such a laugh to play was the inclusion of several items that can change the outcome of a race in the blink of an eye. This random but competitive nature of the game would fuel many multiplayer sessions for years to come, cementing it as one of Nintendo's most beloved IPs. The visuals did nothing but make the whole game even better, and much like F-Zero, it was famous for being one of the first games to utilize the Mode 7 technique. It offered a pseudo 3D look to its visuals by providing a form of texture mapping that allowed the plane of the world to be rotated and scaled effectively. This was made possible by the DSP chip or Digital Signal Processor that would go on to become one of the most popular chipsets to be used in Super Nintendo games throughout the console's life. As you would expect, the backgrounds in Super Mario Kart along with the characters and tracks are crisply detailed, colourful and they have that cutesy but charming Mario flavour as well. One feature of the game was also the split view, which allowed you to see the race from a bird's eye view or even using the bottom half of the screen as a rear view mirror to tackle your rivals as they vied for first place. This game was revolutionary, and like I mentioned it will go on to spawn countless sequels to this day that are beloved throughout the world. Terra Nigma served as the final entry in one of the best RPG trilogies of all time. The story begins with a young boy named Ark living in the peaceful village of Krista, and it's not long until he's swept up into a plot that encompasses the fate of the entire kingdom and everyone that resides within it. I don't want to delve too much into the story as it's easily one of the game's finest qualities, and it's best to go in blind if you do decide to play it. Just expect a narrative that rivals the likes of Final Fantasy VI, and although the cast of characters isn't that large, what it it lacks in quantity is made up for in quality. Now the core of the gameplay sees you travelling the world map, entering towns and fighting your way through dungeons as each of the battles play out in real time. Naturally, you've got a selection of moves to tackle enemies with, and over the course of the adventure, you'll find yourself leveling up and unlocking several more as you progress. But by far the best aspect of Terra Enigma, though, has to be its presentation, and this is where the game really shines. It's essentially the pinnacle of the 2D RPG era, with the most obvious impressive feature being the character sprites. They're all extremely detailed, very well animated and pleasing on the eyes, with a vibrant and lively look that helps bring them all 
brawl to life. Even more impressive are the enemy sprites, with the clear highlight being the boss enemies, which are at times huge and menacing, which plays into the actual threat they pose. The same is true with the game's many environments, which include gorgeous villages, forests, caves, and a number of interesting locations that lend the game an ethereal quality. Square even managed to throw in the little Mode 7 action when it comes to the world map, as well as some very basic cutscenes that convey the story to the player. They're nothing like Final Fantasy VII, of course, but the fact that they're even included is something that should be commended. Overall, if you get the chance, this is definitely a game that's worth playing. The original Metroid quickly became one of Nintendo's flagship titles, so it made sense that a sequel would eventually make its way to their next console. It took everything from the original but managed to build upon it in many meaningful ways, resulting in one of the more influential Super Nintendo games of all time. You once again took up the fight as Samus Aran as you set out to investigate several disturbances at the Galactic Research Facility. This station holds the last Metroid, a fearsome creature which could drain the energy out of its target and after it's captured and taken to a mysterious planet known as Zebes, it's your job to destroy it, along with the threat it poses. Now when you first start the game, your abilities are extremely limited, and you're basically restricted to only jumping, shooting, and ducking, but of course as you progress you slowly come into the possession of far more powerful weaponry, as well as abilities that help you traverse the treacherous environment you find yourself in. One of the main selling points of the Metroid series has always been the freedom of exploration, and here it's in full swim as you venture from area to area, clearing out enemies and collecting items. Now in terms of visuals, Super Metroid is one of those games that has aged exceptionally well. Zebes has to be one of the most atmospheric places you could visit in the 16-bit era, and it is a vast and diverse setting with rocky tunnels, lush vegetation, deep lakes, and an abandoned ship that beckons you to enter. Enemies are varied and interesting, from the dreaded Metroids to the sidehoppers that love to be a nuisance. Furthermore, the bosses themselves are larger than life and manage to rank among the best and most incredible on the system, from the and Kray to the eerie Fantoon. Each has unique complexities of their own, as well as a range of impressive animations that complement the threat they all pose. So if you're able to, it is well worth your time. Doom on the Super Nintendo doesn't really offer the greatest example of compelling gameplay, mainly due to the several limitations of the hardware that resulted in a somewhat dialed back and choppy experience. But the fact that this game was even up and running on the console was a real technical achievement and proved that the Super Nintendo was capable of what many thought it could never pull off. You take on the role of a space marine and must fight his way through wave after wave of monsters all the while navigating puzzling environments. The game has a laser focus on two things defeating the enemy and surviving, and it's here where the core gameplay really excels by providing a nice balance between action and exploration and finding the right weapons to get the job done. Now the game took advantage of the Super FX2 chip, and although it didn't stack up to the other versions of the game on different systems, it did provide a way for Super Nintendo players to experience what was at the time an extremely big deal. Pixelation aside, the graphics were nothing short of brilliant, with the game's environments being fully represented in 3D, along with 2D and enemy and player sprites that brought the authentic Doom adventure to many that didn't have the means to play it on a superior machine. Animation is where the game was hit the most though, with each of the enemies simply facing you and lacking any sort of articulation. Various effects such as smoke and bullet holes were also cut, as well as textures for the ceilings and floors seemingly missing, but all of these cuts were understandable. It wouldn't be until the days of the PlayStation that Doom got a better port, but as I've mentioned, the mere fact that this is even a thing on the Super Nintendo is mind-blowing. As a stairs game, it's not a bad one, but if you're looking to seriously play the game, you're better off trying it elsewhere. Agane The Final Conflict is one of those games that flew under the radar upon its release, but has gone on to garner the respect and admiration today that is severely lacked all those years ago. Much like the name suggests, you take on the role of Hagane, a cybernetic ninja whose job it is to protect the Holy Grail. Naturally, it's eventually stolen, which prompts you to hunt down those responsible over a series of levels that slowly increase in difficulty the further you progress. Now, you've got a ton of skills to enact revenge, from your trusty katana to kunai, bombs, 
arms and a grappling hook that all serve to offer some of the most intense side-scrolling action you'll find on the Super Nintendo. Technically speaking, Garnet doesn't do anything groundbreaking, yet it is a triumph of outstanding art direction. The mystical ninja and steampunk atmosphere makes for some intriguing set pieces, and the game's visual identity is greatly enhanced by the Japanese temples and motif, which never seem to clash with the game's futuristic technology. The game uses only light mode 7 and transparency as special effects, while the overall colour scheme is incredibly dark. The lack of any bright and vibrant aspects to the visual makeup may turn some players off, but for me the aesthetic is one it can call its own, and really helps pull you into the futuristic vibe the game was trying to convey. Ultimately though, it's the sprite work that steals the show, with Hagane himself possessing a string of different animations as you fluidly dart from one end of the screen to the next. This could also be said for the various enemies that comprise the adventure as well, with some truly imaginative designs making up their ranks. The success of Hagane is not due to any type of innovation it introduced to the genre. Its excellence stems from the skill with which the development team juggled tried and true platforming action formulas to produce a strong, well-made title. Serving as the last game in the series on the console, Donkey Kong Country went out with a bang, with everything that had been learnt up along the way seemingly being turned up to 11. This time around you take control of Dixie, who is joined by her baby cousin Kitty, who just so happens to have a severe weight problem. As with the second instalment, there are a vast number of environments for Dixie and Kitty to explore, and it's made up of about 8 different worlds which each house a series of levels that range from jungles to caves and underwater passages that all present present their own distinct challenge for the player to overcome. You'll find yourself jumping, swinging and pounding on enemies as you make your way through to the end, and with the help of several other animals that mix up the gameplay even further, it's by far the best outing the team had out of the three on the Super Nintendo. While the Donkey Kong Country series was always praised for its cutting edge visuals, this particular entry is certainly the best, and is the one that has managed to stand the test of time the most out of them all. This is mainly thanks to its more vibrant colour palette that gave the game a far more playful nature as opposed to its two predecessors that took a much darker approach. It once again sported pre-rendered visuals achieved through a compression technique that converted 3D models into sprites with little loss of detail. This approach was perfected here, and when coupled with the new colour palette, the noticeably low resolution of the prior games disappeared, as everything seemingly blended together far more effectively. This is no more apparent than when it comes to the backgrounds, which also got a huge bump in quality, with some of them possessing up to four layers of parallax scrolling that looked absolutely jaw-dropping at the time. While I personally I personally prefer the pirate theme of Country 2, DK3 absolutely knocked it out of the park. Well that's another video in the bag, keep an eye out for part 2 as that will be coming up soon, so don't forget to subscribe and hit that bell to get notified about new videos that release every Monday and Thursday. You can follow me on all of the socials which are linked below to stay up to date, and also join my growing community on Discord to meet many like-minded gamers to continue the conversation with. I'd like to give a special shout out to my Patreon supporters, Rhino, Skill Jim, Shuden, Richard, Amy, Daniel, Dio, Omar, Strider, Pierre, Carl, Awesome Jacket Dude, Maximus, Scott, Alfred, Terry, Ryan, Alex, GameCube Galaxy, Per Salaryman, and Paddy J for their continued support that helps make these videos possible. If you're interested in joining my Discord or supporting the channel through Patreon, you'll find all of these links in the description. As always, I want to thank you for watching the channel. Your support means the world to me. So until next time, take care.